Great. Well, welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, I'm Asha Easton, the lead for Immersion K. Um, and welcome to the panel on the future of XR and virtual production. I'm just going to go around and do a quick intro for all of our speakers. Um, they all have very incredible bios, uh, so I would try to make them quick and then we'll just get started. So first, I want to welcome Mariana Acosta, who is the CPO and co-founder of Glassbox Technologies, which recently won a Lumiere Award for the virtual production tools that they're building. She's one of the 10 finalists of the Women's Startup Challenge for VR and AI, and she was also named as one of the top 10 VR innovators to watch out for. Prior to that, she, before getting into tech, she worked uh, as an on-set uh, VFX supervisor and senior digital artist, and has over 13 years of experience in the motion picture industry, working for HBO, Columbia, Sony, Digital Domain, et cetera. Next, we have John McInnes, who is a writer, producer, and director. He's been working with Unreal since exclusively with Unreal, actually, since 2015. Uh, he founded McKinnis Studios in 2020, which is a virtual production studio creating hyper-real virtual characters. He's worked with Riot Studios on their 5G digital human and virtual production pipeline for Verizon. Um, he's won an Academy Nickel Fellowship for, the <laughs> for script writing and a Lumiere Award for his AR work, and an epic mega grant for his avatar of David Bowie, which is amazing. Um, next, we have Ben Grossman, who is an Oscar and Emmy award-winning virtual production supervisor. He's worked with everyone awesome, Torsese, J.J. Abrams, John Favreau. He's a co-founder of Magnopus, which is a lead uh, team uh, of 150 people based in L.A., and he was most recently the virtual production supervisor on The Lion King. And finally, last but not least, we have uh, Habib Zargarpour, who is currently the head of Film Development digital, um, for Digital Monarch Media, a division of Unity. He has a very prolific, uh, long, long list of um, visual effects positions on some of my favorite childhood movies. Um, and he's won two BAFTAs and been nominated for two Oscars for his work. So he's been working in this field for a long time and doing amazing things. So thank you all for joining me today. Really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to kick off with the first question. Please drop your questions in the Q&A as we go along. But as a, as a base, just to start, um, I'll, we'll start with Ben. I'm gonna ask you, what, what is virtual production? What are we talking about when we talk about virtual production? And what is the role of a virtual production supervisor look like? Sure. Well, virtual production is the continuation of physical production, but by other means. So it kind of evolved out of visual effects. And we in visual effects think of, our, think of ourselves typically as post-production. Although we're often on set, we're often in pre-production, visual effects supervisors are often the longest people to work on the film besides the director. But in virtual production, we, make a, we bring the digital content onto the physical set so that people can actually see the physical set that they're producing and the digital assets at the same time. And these days now, digital production can sometimes just be the entirety of it. So it's bringing the digital content from post-production, making it happen in real time, in front of the camera, with the rest of the physical crew right there. So LED walls and uh, rear screen projection, game engine powered content, that kind of stuff, connecting physical camera rigs to digital monitors that are producing digital content. And that's pretty much uh, virtual production in a nutshell. It's very vague and hand wavy, but that's that's the state of the industry that we're in right now. A virtual production supervisor is kind of the ultimate schmuck that's responsible for all of that stuff because like visual effects is, uh, we don't know how to do it, just call it a visual effects and give it to the visual effects supervisor, much in the same way that a virtual production supervisor tries to carry both the creative and the technical capabilities and put them in the hands of the filmmakers and um, sort of guide and, and uh, weave their way through that process. So this is like completely upending the whole idea of going from pre-production to production to post-production. It's all kind of, kind of melding together a little bit. Um, for all of you really, you know, how has that changed you know, the makeup of your team on set? And like what skills that do you see that you need within your teams like that are changing? Anybody want to jump on that, Habib? When you say when you say for all of you, really, all of us will shut the hell up and wait for somebody else to answer. So, so you're, you're going to have to just say, Habib, take that one. Hey, Habib, you take that one. <laughs> you're saying about how crews have had to change because of the technology? Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a constant, uh, even in visual effects. I remember when I started at ILM, we had uh, optical compositing folks transitioning to learning match moving and learning animation and using the computer. And it was, 
it was amazing to get you know people that had, had already had decades of experience in film and then they're transitioning now to digital bringing that experience you know so it was a different point of view uh the, that that they were learning the tools with they, could, they, they would they would be able to apply their experience using the new tools so now uh each time there's been changes and transitions in in, in um on the visual effects side and then in real time um you know i had i had already worked in visual effects for about 14 years in transition to real time because i felt that's where the big change comes in is coming in and and that to me was a, a really jarring change to, to to go from from the film world to real time and it took me four or five months to adjust uh, at that point i was working on games uh not virtual production but i could clearly see it, it would affect it so um everything's constantly changing it's really difficult you know uh people just have to get used to it because that's not going to slow down uh so whenever um i'm working with anyone i look i look for people that uh embrace it you know embrace change and they're you know able to adapt adapt quickly uh i myself i remember learning this 3d software and then all of us you know after two years i was like okay i'm I'm relatively good at this. And then some other new 3D software came and that started taking over. And initially I was really bummed because I was like, well, I just you know spent two years getting good at this thing. And that was when I had to make a pact with myself that anything that comes up, I'm going to jump on. Um, I would say that um, I haven't really experienced the transition because my whole, my whole uh, career and experience of virtual production has been in, in real time. So, you know, unlike... Um, the guys here who, are, who you know come from very very um, amazing visual effects backgrounds. You know my background is as a screenwriter, so I was you know, Hollywood screenwriter, and then I was hired to write the video game Call of Duty um, back in 2012. So I worked on that for a couple of years, and and I didn't really realize at the time the level of education I was getting within um, these sorts of technologies. Um, and you know so you know when I came off of Call of Duty, I'd been spending two years working with game engines, working with photo real immersive worlds, uh, photo real avatars of characters, you know, motion capture, um, the whole works. Um, and I didn't have the visual effects background, which in some ways is an advantage because I think what you know, you're talking about is the transition from one to the other. Uh, and one thing I realized coming off of Call of Duty or the experience working on Call of Duty was how siloed these two industries were back then and still are to some degree. Um, and so, you know, when I came back to Hollywood and said, hey, why don't we make movies with real-time game engines, it sort of didn't really fly. And, you know, people were just scratching the surface and, and opening up to, to game engines. And, um, you know, it's been a very, very interesting time over the last five years, and particularly, you know, Unity Unreal are, are really just leading this revolution, and it is a revolution. And I think, you know, Ben and Habib are sort of leading this revolution from within the industry. And I feel like sort of I'm coming from <laughs> from from the outside as as a filmmaker uh, who basically jumped into real time just as a filmmaker with, without an experience in in visual effects, but with a somewhat of an experience in storytelling and, and movie making. And um, so it wasn't even so much a transition; it was more about like um, evangelizing and saying, "Hey, this is how we should do stuff." Um, you know, what was the biggest pushback from people not wanting to adopt this new kind of workflow? Um, one of the, well, you know, it's, it's funny because in the gaming world, you know, every, they, they went back then at least, um, they're, they're all looking to movies as their references. So on Call of Duty, you know, they wanted to hire a Hollywood screenwriter like myself because they wanted that Hollywood blockbuster feel, you know, on their games, you know, and all of their references about what we talked about, you know, in terms of the, the visual style and what we we're trying to, you know, convey was all sort of movie references, more, you know, war, big war movies and stuff, which is, which is very cool. Uh, Hollywood, unfortunately, uh, uh, is a little bit snobbish about, you know, gaming. Um, and, you know, as you know, one, one of the biggest... Hollywood? Snobbish? <laughs> what are you talking about? You, you, can't, you can't come in here with that accent. <laughs> Hollywood of being snobbish. I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean... So, but, but you know, you know the, the term, oh, it looks like a game is, is sort of like the ultimate sort of put down. And, and, and so... That is true. Uh, I, I will admit to having heard that for most of my career. <laughs> 
Yeah. So, and, and, it, and it, well, you know, and I, I didn't have that sort of, you know, baggage, you know, to, when approaching this equation at all. And also I've been very fortunate to be working on, you know, the call of duty that I worked on was the new generation, you know, of, of consoles. They were really pushing for like, you know, um, um, photorealistic, you know, digital humans and stuff. And as a screenwriter, that was obviously my focus and interest is like, I don't really care about the technology. I'm all about story and character. And so the fact that we were, you know, making Kevin Spacey as a digital human avatar, and I was seeing my actors, you know, as these as these avatars, and it just blew me away. So, so as I said, I, you know, I was very fortunate to be working on that. That was, you know, for 2014 when it came out, that was the sort of cutting edge of, of, of gaming at that point. So I was kind of spoiled in that way. So I kind of like, well, we've just done this, you know. Um, so that, I guess that was the biggest pushback. But I mean, honestly, it's um, like anything. I mean, the workflows are very, very different. Um, you know, it is a very, very different way of thinking as, as these guys will attest. And as I said, like, it's a sort of transition of, of moving into a new space. And, you know, but the, the seduction and the, uh, of real time is, is immense. You know, I, th I think now that the, uh, you know, the world and everybody is really seeing the results of what you can do with real time. Um, what would you say are the biggest, what are the biggest benefits then to switching to this type of production? Um, I don't, I mean, I'm interested to see what, what Ben and Habib say about that because, you know, I, I kind of started it like, for me, this is a whole new wave of filmmaking. I think this is going to usher in a renaissance of filmmaking. Um, you know, Ben. I'm gonna, I'm gonna I, I, would, I, would, I would kick it to Mariana because Mariana yeah, is like, yeah. she's at a company that brings this technology and puts it in the hands of people who don't know how to use it. And so she's on the front lines of experiencing what what is mariana what is the shock that people go through when they're like okay i want to get into virtual production what's the biggest stuff i need to know that's different between tr traditional production and virtual production i think one of the biggest um, shocks uh when when you bring this technology uh to maybe studios or you know kind of independent content creators that haven't used it before is just the ability to visualize because they i think they're coming to the table like if you're gonna uh, you know meet on set I think they're coming with this idea of traditional visual effects or where everything's going to take a really long time, even if they heard, you know, what amazing, uh, all the promises of and the seduction, as John said, of real time. Uh, but they don't really believe that. And then once they're on set, and even, you know, I mean, the game engines have done such an incredible, because I've heard that a lot also coming from visual effects, like, oh, it looks gay, you know, it looks like a game. But yeah, maybe you could have said that, you know, in the first you know, <laughs> Matrix or something like that. But now, I mean, it's just the, you know, the photorealistic quality and the photo quality is just amazing. So it's just the ability to visualize uh, like in real time, the, what they can see, what they can do and all the possibilities. For example, things like lighting or, or effects, which are one of the two most costly and you know, slow parts of the visual effects pipeline. Once they're on set and you, they see their scene and then you get them into a headset you get them into virtual reality and then they can do a whole walkthrough, a whole 3D walkthrough of their scene. And then they're able to start, you know, playing around with lighting and effects, et cetera. It's just that I would say the biggest shock is like the ability to visualize in real time what a scene can look like. And maybe <laughs> having to create those assets in the first place because we're common in, in visual effects. It's like producers want to shoot the movie and then they'll let the visual effects people figure it out later. But with yeah, fix it virtual in production, you, you got to make the assets before you can shoot anything. And that's, that I think is one, probably one of the bigger shocks that people go through is they're like, oh yeah. no, I can't shoot on Monday because I haven't even started prepping my assets yet. Well, I'm going to push to shoot a month and, and start building out the world that we're actually going to shoot. Otherwise we just show up with a bunch of cool equipment and nothing to shoot. Yeah, I think, to, you know, um, I'm going to show a short clip um, to, to kind of get the context of how um, I actually uh, l discovered how the impact, how much impact it can have, even even going into it thinking, yes, this is going to have a lot of impact, but, but being blown away by how much. Uh, we started collaborating in 2012 with Alex McDowell, who's a production designer on a Disney project. And this project, uh, you know, it was in the Pinewood stages. Everybody on the production was able to interact with the set and the designs. And that changed their outcome. They would they would change what they were doing, uh, you know. And then on Jungle Book, John Favreau would use VR to re redesign the sets. Ben Ben was a witness to that. Um, 
all of these interactions, um, uh, the biggest biggest change is communication. So, you know, before you had something really rigid where things would get designed, you know, two D concept art. Then it would take months to build it in three D or build it as a miniature. Then you're on set filming it, and then you you know the, you, there's things you can't really change once you're in. Now. Uh, you're, you're basically short circuiting the whole process where uh, every single aspect of it can be uh, seen by the designers, the key creatives, I call them. You know, you have the director, the DP, the visual effects uh, uh, supervisor, production designer, all of them uh, can be experiencing everything throughout. So uh, for Ready Player One, Adam Stockhausen was using VR to design the VR stages and uh, you know, that that allowed everybody, including uh, Spielberg, to be able to understand what the sets are going to look like, for the actors to understand what the sets are going to look like. Um, so all of this, you know, what used to be really difficult where, you know, you, you find yourself in post and then you're like, you know, you get the shot together, you get the visual effects and you're like, I actually don't like the design of the environment. You know, that's a really costly, expensive thing to change that late in the game. So what, what's been different, you know, and, and I've been um, witnessing as these tools propagate is now you're able to actually uh, have those key creatives communicate with these tools in a much easier way and then they can interact with things. So uh, especially I think what VR does is puts you in that space three-dimensionally because a lot of people ask like, well, is it really that different in VR if I'm just looking at it on, you know, on a 2D screen anyway, you know, the, the same environment. But once you're in that space in VR, it's a different ball game. Uh, you know, it, it's kind of like having been there. Uh, on, that, on that point about using VR though, I mean, there are parts of virtual production that don't necessarily need, need a VR headset, right? Like you see with the Mandalorian, they use like that big LED screen thing. That's incredible to set. But then I've seen other clips like Ben, where you use the headset um, in the Lion King, for example, for for Previs and stuff. So w w where is it? I mean, more important well, to use that or not? Like, like what it's would just you? It's like being on a movie set. You, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. There's a little no, lag. No, no, Go ahead. No, no, no. <clears throat> well, it's just like being on a movie set. When you're on a movie set. Imagine you're a director, you're walking around the set, you're looking at things, the trees, the light, the actors, you're moving some things around, you're getting things, and then you go back and you look through the camera monitor and you go, hmm, okay, and then you step back away and then you like change some things and then you come back to the monitor. Like on The Lion King or any virtual production, you, you want to be in VR when you want to see the world around you and you want spatial context. And you can be in VR with a monitor in VR in front of you so you can see what the camera's seeing, but well, you can like choreograph everything around you and make adjustments. So I think it's the same in virtual production. You don't want to be in VR the whole time. Although sometimes on Lion King, John Favreau would put the VR headset on and then he would fly up to like an overlook looking down on the virtual set where all the people and actors and everything were moving around. And he would just set up a little camp and watch. And so you were like, John, why are you watching in VR? You can just take the headset off and you can watch it on the monitors. He's like, yeah, but I, I feel like I'm on the movie set. I feel like I'm part of the crew. And so you would just sit there and play with rocks and, you know, redesign trees and things. It gets to be immersive, but you don't have to be in it all the time. And, and so some people, it's not for everybody, but it's just another, it's another form of monitor. You can, you can do it exactly like you would on a movie set, just walking around and uh, looking through the, the, the camera. Someone just asked, is mixed reality AR starting to be used with mixing CGI? Mm. It's a good question. No. Is it, have you done it? <laughs> <laughs> not there no, yet <laughs> no i think we, we've all tested it but the problem is that um the problem is that you have this dream that you want people to be able to see the movie while you're shooting them making the movie and you just can't because you know i can't make these the ar glasses yet and so yes to a certain extent you can and i think all of us have tested using ar glasses or ar phones and so right now yes you can use ar uh, smartphones for you know virtual camera work or for some showing concepts and things like that but i, I consider those you know they're they're helpful little gags but they're not they're not really you know the production tools that you kind of need them to be at the present moment in a perfect world 
we would have the ability to put actors and the crew so that when they walk out onto the set, it, whether it's a physical world set or a digital world set, and they could see the dinosaurs and you know the the incoming meteor strike or whatever it is that that's being added. But uh, for right now, I mean, Mariana, are you are people asking you for AR support and 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 giving you AR problem cases to solve? No, and we actually, um, I'm, I'm sure you guys have the same, or we have a little AR app, which is just to do like really quick previous or a really quick kind of like blocking when you're doing your, your, your virtual location scout. Um, so meaning, you know, you're looking around with the iPad, let's say you're, you know, in a backyard and then you can select from a predefined library if you want, what kind of assets do you want? Speaking about assets, uh, buildings, monsters, vehicles, whatnot. And then you can start, you know, scaling them, positioning them and kind of see what your, you know, physical set would look with some, um, you know, synthetic AR, um, elements into it and you know some people like it but for the most part it's something kind of like an addition to it's, it's not like replacing any of the workflows just yet and it's not something it is mostly used for kind of more pop-up experiences and more like other, other types of uh, you know it's, it's like a, for other types of productions not so much you know filmmaking uh, or like shorts or like a full-on movie or anything like that the key use of it was um movies like Avatar, uh, you know, they're motion capturing actors and then the, those actors need to be on surfaces that match the virtual world. So you have Jake and Neytiri in this, you know, they're, they're supposed to be jumping, jumping from branch to branch or going over, you know, terrain. Um, similarly on Jungle Book, you know, the pre-visualization involved, you know, mocapping actors. But so someone would have an AR glasses and they would they could see the virtual world and they could see the physical motion capture set and they would basically uh, go to key points along that ground and make sure that those match as a way to basically build something physically that matches what's in the virtual and they would have these you know the different kind of size blocks and wedges that they could use to construct uh, that's to me um, a really helpful use of AR. Um, when you have physical sets you're shooting that you're going to be augmenting, or entirely virtual sets you're going to be shooting, but you, you, you're shoot, you know motion capturing real, real actors. Uh, that's the easiest way to tell uh, if if the virtual is matching the physical. Uh, I, I got to work on uh, Hololens while at Microsoft, uh, especially a launch title. Um, called Fragments, if anybody gets their hands on it, HoloLens, check that out. It's, it's interesting. Uh, you know, adopt, adoption of VR has been, you know, gradual. And I think adoption of AR is uh, even, even slower than that. But, but I think we're going to see, uh, dip, once we get, uh, like Ben said, more convenient devices, uh, mm -hmm. that's going to be where the change happens. I think so there's a question some... by, by um, Olaf uh, in, in our yeah. panel about, you know, the obstacles, you know, to, um, you know, people in actors and stuff struggling with that. This is, you know, more technology. And, and I've been having a lot of that. Um, I've been, you know, signing up a lot of conventional Hollywood filmmakers to my movie slate and actually sort of selling them this process because their initial you know, conception is like, oh, it's just more, it's more technology. And you know they think it's taking away from the process of what filmmaking is, and I actually think um, real time is getting back to what filmmaking is, which is about story and character and relationships and actors working with each other and relating to each other, rather than being locked into some sort of frame and storyboard that has been predetermined and prefixed. I mean, if you think and about how, about like uh, how real time engines are going to impact on immersive storytelling, not just VR. Sorry, I lost your audio then. I didn't hear it very well. Oh, the sorry, impact the of question of how real-time engines are going to impact on immersive storytelling, not just in VR. Oh, yeah. I, yeah. Sorry. They, 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 they already have. They already have. You see a lot of, you know, short films, VR experiences, et cetera. I mean, cinematic uh, production using game engines yeah. has been done for like a lot of years now. So it, it already has. And if you yeah. see things like, I mean, even if we're, we're talking about immersive, not, not just 
it's immersive, but the ability to, to just have branched narratives, to have interactive sort of storytelling. You know, all of this is changing uh, storytelling and it, it already has for quite a while now. Well, it's, well, it's, it's an existential sorry. shift. Oh, sorry. It, it's an existential shift between the traditional relationship between the storyteller and the audience. And in theory, real-time engines enable us to remove the storyteller's responsibility to create the entire thing and hold the audience captive. You know, films and television, you park your ass on the sofa, you watch television, you watch the screen, you receive the point of view of the director. As soon as real-time engines exist, then suddenly there's a bi-directional relationship between the audience and the, uh, and the filmmaker, which I think is fantastic because I'm so bored of passive one directional storytelling. And I kind of like the idea that if the audience just gets up and walks out of the living room, then the filmmaker has to go, okay, well, I need to rethink this because they're not interested. And so what's great about interactive storytelling that's enabled by real-time engines is that, yeah, now the audience is a cast member. Maybe they're the director. Maybe you shouldn't be telling so much story. Maybe you should just be creating a world with opportunities and letting them choose the path that's good to them. Maybe an entire family can go into the story and wander in different directions and then come back at the end. And I think that's something that we couldn't do in filmmaking. And quite frankly, films and television have been stagnant over the last hundred years. They haven't fundamentally changed very much. And the last 20 years, we've kind of capped out. It's like, all right, we've blown up the worlds. We've shown everything that you can show. We're very close to cracking the digital humans problem. And now we have this opportunity to take the audience, put them inside the movie, and then break all those traditional rules to, uh, to linear narrative and, and all that kind of stuff. So that I think is a pretty big transformation that's enabled by all this. We just have to mature the gags a little bit and then figure out, okay, now how much does this really cost to, <laughs> to make and distribute and how do people consume it? This is the like next question about, is this only within the realms of bigger budgets? What are the opportunities for low and mid-range budgets in movie productions? Well, I mean, I, I'm kind of ready. I mean, I, I just have you see behind me, real-time shorts challenge. So, you know, I, I think it's, I mean, I talked earlier on about this ushering a new phase of filmmaking because, you know, anybody can get hold of Unity, anybody can get hold of Unreal and start making making movies in this way. and. So, um, um, you know, I, I launched the short film, Real Time Short Challenge, a couple of months ago, um, kind of just because of what happened with the pandemic. And I had all these scene files of really, really cool VR experiences that I've made over the years that, you know, were sort of cutting edge and were seen all around the world. It's sort of, you know, industry kind of stuff and promoted by industry sort of, you know, brands and companies, but they weren't seen by the vast majority of people. And so I thought, well, what if I give away these scene files to any filmmaker that wants to use them and just give them the keys to the kingdom to basically make, make a short film, whatever they want to make. So it was, a, it was kind of an experiment. And I think the, re the results of that were really quite remarkable and the, the quality of film, you know, filmmakers who hadn't really um, used, even used Unreal before, you know, the, the two winners of the real time shorts. Um, Luke and, and Kevin, they were actually traditional DPs, live action DPs who used the short film challenge to um, get into Unreal and to make something. And they ended up winning the real time shorts challenge. Um, and that was that was the case with a number of filmmakers who, who hadn't you know dived into this before. So and so the costs of that, I mean, yes, I made those those uh, scene files, you know, with characters and environments, but um, you know, in terms of what you can actually achieve with a with a game engine, with off the shelf assets and you know all that sort of stuff, it, it's it's quite remarkable. So, um, um, you know, I think that there will be a, it, it's whole different levels because the, the movies that, that Habib and, and Ben are working on are obviously you know hun tens, hundreds of millions of dollar movies. You know, major major Hollywood IP. Um, it's a different equation, but I think there is there is an opportunity here for you know, filmmakers to dive in without very much resources um, and just to just just to get making again. It's the more yeah. important part. Even even John Favreau was saying when we were doing Lion King, I want these tools to become ubiquitous so that children in their homes can make movies like this. And that is, you know, I mean, there's a lot of assets to build, but that's the the ambition is that you don't need even the Lion King set we didn't have hundreds of millions of dollars worth of equipment and we didn't have that same, you know, physical crew presence. So you are in a sense looking at the democratization of filmmaking where you don't have to buy a, you know, multi-million dollar piece of equipment to get a certain shot. You have something that you can do on your phone at home in your basement. Yeah, totally, I, 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 totally I, I, made I, it accessible. 
And to speak have, about, I, I yeah. have to add to the asset part because, for example, I, Ben, I'm going to disagree with you on the like, well, well, when the biggest shocker is like the assets, what we usually do, and that is something that independent content creators can definitely take, you know, and students and whoever can take advantage of, is the fact that both uh, engine companies, you can go to their asset store or marketplace and, you know, you can download, like, within an hour, you can have an environment that looks at least is similar to what you're looking for or you can buy an environment for like very 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 cheap and you can download really rigged assets and you can download plants and you can download so many other things i mean even full-on crowds sure. you know with ai behavior etc and you can start visualizing right away and you can actually build a whole you know movie with those free assets as john mckinnis can attest to that um so that's something that the if, oh my light just went off uh, so that's something that the Indian companies have definitely also helped a lot in democratizing. And then, of well, course, I, I, I needed a, a, a stealth Black Hawk helicopter for my Bin Laden experience. And I thought, well, either I could I could pay somebody to make that, um, you know, one of my team and put them on it. But there happened to be a stealth Black Hawk helicopter on the Unreal Marketplace for forty nine ninety five. So, <laughs> uh, you know, and then we can dress that up. However poor, we want. poor Osama Bin Laden. Exactly. If he hadn't been on the asset store, he might have gotten away with the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, I think I definitely think accessibility is there for sure, and that's what these two tools have done. And especially now with the situation, uh, you know, with uh, uh, COVID nineteen, everybody uh, working from home, uh, we're working with a lot of filmmakers, and all they need is you know their phone and this guy, which you know is is sometimes taboo in Hollywood, like we said. Um, but, but you know, very, very affordably, you could start visualizing your projects and, cre and creating them because of the accessibility of these things. And somebody or you could use an iPad and one of these things as well. Oh, that too, yeah, you. exactly. Oh. You have both in, with Glassbox, right, Marianne, a live client, Dragonfly and Beehive? Yeah, and to take this opportunity to like for, for the company pitch because that's precisely why we wanted to uh, create Glassbox. We wanted you know, content creators of all kinds to just be able to download and start using tools where they can do facial performance capture, that's live client, where they can start using a virtual camera that is cross-platform across, you know, any uh, digital content creation tool that you're using. Uh, so that way making it easier for artists to make the transition into real time and just start, you know, recording, uh, play, doing playback, reviewing, bookmarking their scenes if they're in a very, you know, large scene and whatnot. Uh, that's Dragonfly, a virtual camera, and then we created Beehive, which is a, you know, multi-collaboration, multi-editor tool, also cross-platform, so that you can be working remotely uh, with your team, and you can be inside of virtual reality or not, and you don't have to worry about import or export process, you don't have to worry about perforce or doing version control, and so this way, it just, we want to help democratize the use of virtual production for all types of content creators without the need of, because th I think there was a question uh, somewhere in the Q&A about the, there's so much uh, need for artists to have skills on game engines and whatnot. And, and yeah, you, you need to have, to have a lot of technical people. So if you can remove that barrier of entry and just make it easier and more accessible for everyone to start using virtual production, then it won't feel like, so overwhelming, maybe for folks that have been doing just hardcore visual effects for 20 years or just using Maya for 20 years, or just, you know, maybe they want to switch from traditional filmmaking into virtual production and all of your skills are transferable. Um, so that's what we do. We just want to make it easier and more accessible for everyone. There's a question about uh, if you're using game engines, does that restrict you to game patterns of storytelling instead of telling our story? Absolutely not. You can tell your story just like any uh, film, but le let me describe the, in, in simple terms the difference when, with real time and why we appreciate it. So when I was in visual effects uh, working on films, in order to get one frame of a shot, it would take me an hour to five hours. I'd have to wait and with a computer, it would take it one hour to five hours to render that one frame. If I wanted to see my shot in motion, I have to do I have to wait for the next day because the a hundred uh, processors need to run needed to run overnight or thousands of them need to run overnight to render every frame for me to see my shot in motion. That's the world of visual effects, and you couldn't budget. And so, 
uh, one person would work on a five second shot for two months. They would be looping that same shot for two months to three months, sometimes six months, if it's a complicated shot, because of that time. Now, what real-time engines do is they just eliminate that. There is no waiting. Everything's real-time. It's running 30 or 24 or 40, 60 frames per second or 90 if you're in VR. And whatever changes you make, you're seeing them instantly. You can see them in motion. So you're just short-circuiting and eliminating that, that render time, which, which would take uh, millions of dollars of processors, uh, you know, distribution scripts, all of this complexity. So uh, it's, just, it's just a faster way to get your visuals uh, and be able to, because it's real time, you can interact with them, you can move around, see them in three dimensions, see them in VR. So the actual storytelling part can be exactly identical to any film. Well, actually, I was going to add, actually, because I was looking at a couple of the questions in the thing about, you know, actors' reaction to this stuff. Um, you know, my experience work on Call of Duty with Kevin Spacey, and he, he loved it because, you know, motion capture, performance capture, you're basically capturing, or you can capture the whole scene all at once with all of the actors. So every single actor has a face cam on, every single actor is in a mocap suit and being captured all at the same time. So it becomes much more like theater um, so it's, it's actually extremely actor and performance friendly. Um, and once actors understand that, that they don't have to spend hours in hair and makeup beforehand, they don't have to block out a scene, work out all these different shots and then do the scene repeatedly, um, you know, for a wide shot and close up and all the rest of it. Um, you know, they can actually work very, very organically together um, to create the scene. And then, um, as I say, capture it all at once in, in, in very few takes. It's very efficient on the actor's time and very focused on, on those performances. So it sort of liberates, you know, as, as well as the sort of visual side of it, but just in terms of the performance and hands-on acting side, it really is, you know, liberating filmmaking, I think, for actors once they understand that equation. What about other people who work on, people who operate the, machine, the cameras and the dollies and things like that? You know, because I, I saw that you, you put sensors on that kind of equipment and then you can do all the same movements in, in the real-time engine. So like, how, do, how do they feel about this evolution of stuff? Like, do their skills then still remain necessary? Do you still have them there? You can just wrap well, it all. I mean, the, the, it, it depends on what you want to do. You don't have to do any of this stuff. But if you want to take advantage of the skills of someone who's been doing a job for longer than you've been alive, then you have to take the tools that they're used to using and plug them into the digital world so that they're using the same interfaces that they're used to using to bring their skills to the to the to the party so to speak and ironically it's like you know habib shows the xbox controller it's like if you hand an xbox controller to any filmmaker they will immediately throw it back at your head almost generally some filmmakers will be like yeah no i can i can you know john favreau's a gamer he'll mm -hmm but he does it secretly because he knows that this isn't a tool of filmmaking and it's not, mm -hmm. it's going to result in a game focused product. Now, my daughter or, you know, any one of our, the next generation of filmmakers, they will like this, I speak natively in this language. This is how I communicate. You put a set of wheels in their hand to operate a shot and they'll be like, this is the stupidest thing I could possibly think of. Who, what idiot invented this nonsense? Mm -hmm. So everybody has a different opinion and it's based on different generations, but, if you want to make these worlds open and accessible to every range of, of, uh, of you know, contributor, then you got to give them an interface to be able to do that. So we take dollies and cranes and we encode them, whether optically or digitally or mechanically, and then we feed that into the system so that there's a digital twin to the physical equipment. But ultimately, at the end of the day, you don't have to do any of those things if you don't want to. It's just more a matter of look at the human and decide what is the most natural way for them to be a part of this world and then give them that interface. And also from an audience point of view, you know, I, I was, it was fascinating with what you guys did on The Lion King and Caleb de Chanel, like bringing in, you know, you know, weighted cameras and stuff because, you know, audiences, audience have, have spent 120 years looking at what films are and that, you know, they were very attuned, very finely attuned to what things look like and what things feel like. And I think if we're, you know, selling movies and making movies, which I think is a great idea, you know, we don't just go for a game engine and a virtual camera that's flying around. It's actually very important to bring those skills 
and aesthetic sensibilities. I remember when I first was hired on Call of Duty and I, they was like, we want this to look like a movie. And I thought, well, why don't you hire a DP just to advise about lighting? Um, you know, because if you come from a gaming sensibility, you, you have a very, very different relationship to, to light. And, you know, in movies, a lot of things like motivation, what motivates it in terms of the story, in terms of the scene, in terms of the lighting, what's motivating the light is very, very, very important. Whereas it's not so important in gaming. So, so bringing all of those sensibilities and so like a lot of people I think are afraid of the technologies because they think that they're, you know, you know, do we still need actors? That's the question I get, do we still need actors? You know, and I'm like, yes, we need hair and makeup people to advise. I mean, on my David Bowie stuff, I use top, you know, top Hollywood hairstylists and makeup people to come and talk to me and talk to my team about, about you know, how makeup and hair works. You know, you need those real, you know, skills and experience with, with those, those, those things in order to get the right quality and the right feel of, of what it is you're doing in a game engine. In a way, they're, they're more important than, than ever, I think. And people should be really talking to, to those people who have that experience because it's, 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 it's going to really, you know, vastly improve upon their productions and what they're doing. Yeah, ultimately, it's about accessibility. So, you know, a, a game controller, uh, the reason we use that is you have a lot of analog input. So um, for us, creating shots is about performance. So you want to be able to uh, manually perform what you want to get. Um, now, we also support DP wheels, like the Ben was saying, that, you know, people can bring their own equipment and plug it in and use what they're used to. Um, but, you know, it's very democratizing to be able to support, you know, simple devices like this. A lot of people are used to them. Um, and it, it, it's, it's just a matter of accepting that as a, as a you know, simply an input device that allows you to have a lot of configurations. Um, you know, we, we had a shoot uh, this year, last year um, uh, and in Berlin and, you know, the DP was um, just finding out about this, these virtual tools and his initial reaction was, uh, you know, very, very surprised and, and he wasn't sure what to make of it. Once he tried it for half an hour, then he was like, you know, he was in heaven because he understood the, how, you know, the power of what that could bring to what he's doing in terms of uh, visualizing the, the project. So um, that's, that's where change is difficult for people, but once they see what it can do, uh, that's what helps. There's an interesting comment here about sound design. Um, and someone's saying like, when I do an immersive project, I place image development alongside the spatial audio de development at the same time. Is that affected by? real-time production this came up recently some some people in technology called and asked like okay we have this new immersive audio and we want to try this out and i said you know it's funny if you don't work in the movie business you would you would intuitively assume that that's a great idea and you may be right in the future at present ironically for hundreds of years we record audio later like the only thing that we get on a movie set typically is actor's dialogue. And we try to minimize everything else on the movie set to be as silent as possible. So we're focused on just capturing pristine actor's dialogue. We don't often, you know, environmental audio is, 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 is not often uh, preferable because you just can't capture it clean enough when you're shooting a live action set. Now, if you were going to do a different kind of storytelling, a different kind of filmmaking, if it was going to be interactive, like in 360 video, we had this problem all the time, how do I get the audience to look where I want them to look? In traditional media, I just point the camera at it. And I go, look at this thing. Here's a close up. See this thing? Ah. It's a lot easier to grab the audience's face and shove them into the storytelling thing that you need them to see in order to move to the next part. But in a 360 video, you're like, ah, I was looking over here when the thing happened over there and I totally missed it. So you use sound to direct the audience. You hear this like noise behind you and then you turn around and you realize, oh, there's the, you know, whatever, dragon or naked person or who cares. And so sound to direct the viewer's attention when they have all these options becomes critical. But in passive linear narrative, traditional filmmaking storytelling, we wouldn't introduce sound into virtual production because we just haven't, uh, that's just not part of the workflow. Actors don't re react to it. That's that my opinion. I mean, other people might. No, no, it, 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 I just read your question in the, in the um, your, your comment in the, in the, in the remarks here about ent where entertainment is and thinking about passive and story, you know, passive filmmaking and story. And I think what you're talking about in, in uh, spatial audio is a very interesting question because I think 
the way I see movies now, uh, real-time movies, is actually the, you know, is rather, rather than being a final rendered product, it is actually the seed. This, you know, this, the movie is the seed of something, uh, 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 an opening, a portal to a whole range of experiences that, that can come, that can be meshed with the, with the storytelling. You start with the but, traditional movie, and then if you're a super fan, you think, well, I love that scene so much in Blade Runner, I want to actually step in, into that scene and walk around it. And now you can go into VR and do that. And then, you know, all those elements of spatial audio and interactivity now then come into play. So, you know, you can start thinking about movies as being the seed of this, this opening, this door to the universe of your movie. Um, and again, I mean, I'm, I'm a huge movie fan. I mean, that's what I spent my, most of my career, you know, trying to do. And the interesting thing about movies is actually a very stable form. You know, it's kind of been what it is. And there are obviously pluses, you know, and, you know, you know pluses and disadvantages about, about that. But it is actually an incredibly stable form that people generally want to consume and watch, which means there's a whole big economy around that. So, you know, if we start making real-time movies, and I said that, you know, that's going to actually accelerate, you know, the ancillary industries of VR and AR and all of these other experiences and just means that the audiences and fans around the world can can experience their their product, their their film, their IP, if we want to call it IP, um, in all these new and interesting ways. And that's going to take us down wormholes that we can't even imagine right now. So um, but it's going to be audience led, which I'm really excited about, you know, taking that cinema audience and taking them into, you know, th the 3D world. You guys, there's a question here about from someone who said they're gonna they have a project in prep and they want to um, combine live action talent and real environment and LED walls and a motion control camera. Do you have any experience with that workflow? Any input you can offer on that? My LED walls are huge, <laughs> or going to be. It is coming coming it's, super fast. It, it I I'll speak candidly here. LED walls are overhyped. And they are overpromised, and they are underdelivered. Thank you. And I can say that from having done it. They are more expensive than you think. You will not save any money, and you probably could just get away with a rear screen projection technique that's worked for you know eighty years. But there are cases where you do need a video wall, and the work that John did on the Mandalorian, you know, there were cases where it was like he was very critical. Do we really need this? What value is it providing? And there are cases in that show where it does provide value. And when you really get that dialed in and you get it nailed, then you start amortizing savings. And then season one, season two, season three, really the savings starts to come from, I've built all these things in a real time engine. I can pull them back in a second. I don't have to travel the whole location to a, a I don't have to travel the whole circus to a new location. Like you start to realize those benefits. If you decide for whatever reason, unless you're Marvel, that you need to shoot on a video wall and you're only going to do it for a week or two, then you're wasting, you're probably wasting money. It's almost a guarantee. And now I'm a huge fan of LED walls, but starting one up and then shutting one down and then creating the content for it in the middle is probably the most expensive thing that you could do. I'll bet you could have built the entire set in a stage or gone to a location in the same amount of effort. But being that there is COVID, um, yeah, you, you sometimes might not have a choice but to pay that premium extra in order to shoot in isolation like that. So the question that you ask is kind of like, how do I shove 10 years worth of bad decisions into five minutes of advice? And I, I, I don't even know how we could answer that question in a day or two, but I would just throw that out about video walls. Like, like there's going to be a sort of market correction when everyone realizes, oh my God, these aren't silver bullets that can be used in every single circumstance. And mm -hmm. It, you're going to roll in and plan on spending millions of dollars. If you if you try to do it for less than that, then you're going to be shoehorned into only being able to use it in certain instances in certain ways. I'm going to counter what Ben said. Um, I feel that I feel exactly like when inkjets came out and we had dot matrix printers. Um, yes, things are always expensive in the beginning. You know, so were OLED TVs. Uh, what's going to happen is because of the rush to this technology, prices are going to plummet. We're going to have much more affordable LED walls. It's going to become as standard on any stage, just like green screen is. So absolutely, you can't do everything with it, for sure. Uh, we've been doing a lot of uh, tests ourselves uh, on, 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 on several projects uh, that, that you know, it turns out to actually be an incredible tool for certain things. 
So I, I always show people the footage we, we have, and then when they realize what size screen we shot it on, they're shocked because they're like, that's impossible. There's no way, you know, I just saw an entire universe. So, um, you know, if you, if you have a wide establishing shot, you don't probably want to use an LED for that unless it's an interior, like for Mandalorian uh, cases. But, um, uh, you know, that's where it can really save money on a production is a, a lot of films and a lot of TV series, uh, a lot of shots are about close-up dialogue. Uh, where you know the background slightly out of focus, you're still gonna need your foreground set pieces, um, but it's gonna be f you know pretty free That's to not have to strike the set on a project and just be able to load it by hitting a button. But that's the point, though, is that is that an LED wall is a five to twenty-five million dollar investment in capital expenditures plus the software uh, software and the operating costs, and you only need it if you have an actor in front of it, not too close and not too far away, mm -hmm. that is going to interact with it. It's a very specific niche of the, of the filmmaking process. Like if you have an establishing shot, don't use an LED screen. What do you need it for? Unless you're gonna have an actor stand right in front of it for whatever reason and get that lighting. So there's, you really have to break your script down and go, ah, it only works in these instances. And the argument that I would make is that I don't think Hollywood would commoditize the price of LED walls because if you took every single movie stage in the world, everyone, every state, every country, you took everyone and you coated the walls and ceiling in LED walls, you'd probably be about half of Las Vegas's billboards in terms of total square footage of stuff. So I think the LED screen industry is not like, woohoo, Hollywood's, I mean, they are, but I don't think it's gonna like cause the price to, you know, it's, it's hardware. It's not gonna cause the price to go down. They never go down, they only go up. They just don't go up as fast. So. It's it's an expensive having done it before. And I'm, well, the one we, yeah, you know, we can cut two I'm zeros gonna off of what you voted. I'm gonna intervene here, and let's remember one thing. I am totally with Ben on this one, a hundred percent. It's so expensive. Like, yeah, all oh, the promise of the lead walls. Yeah, they've been there for a really long time. Whatever. But if we're also speaking about democratization of the tools and accessibility and being able to do yeah, virtual exactly. production by the pool with your your iPad and your you know one Rococo suit or whatever, you're never gonna be able to afford the lead wall. Period. Never. That's I have never really, you don't, you don't have to buy one. You just need to rent one. And you know, like the that's ones... not realistic. <laughs> I'm not. Overall, overall though, it is massively like cost effective to be using real time production, right? So do you do you yes. see this being the future of all film production? Are all the major studios like running towards this new method and preparing? I mean, you know, you can make a CG model of New York or you can build an actual full size set of New York. Which one's cheaper? But you don't need an LED wall for that. So yes. No, you don't. Exactly. <laughs> it's just but LED yes, walls. Yes. Yeah. I, I think it's safe but, to say that every major studio in Hollywood and indie filmmaker and everybody and their and their mother at this point, even my own grandmother called and asked if she could use it for her birthday party. So virtual <laughs> production is definitely going to be saving money. And it, well, just think about it. It's like it's what we did with previous before, but you're starting to put the hands, the tools in the hands of people who are less talented. I don't, I don't want to say it that way. Let me, well, Technical? you interpret that however you want. But the idea is that, hey, I can see the results in real time. So I'm saving time there and I can like fix my own mistakes quickly rather than waiting as Habib said for days to render a single frame and see what's up. So there's no question that everybody in all the major studios have been for the last year and a half putting a significant amount of effort into what is our virtual production strategy? How are we employing this technology across all of our verticals? and you know, rama rama ding ding. So yeah, it's on fire. You should get some. <laughs> <laughs> if I could, okay, because we only have a few minutes left. Um, just, I guess, one last question to wrap up with is what, what would you like to see improved next? Like what would be your next dream scenario? You know what the pain points are on set. What would you like to see happen? Who wants to go first? John? I talk too much. <laughs> <laughs> We always need faster GPUs, you know. Um, yeah. We, we, you know, you, you can keep cramming. Uh, it, we did a real time, we built a real time ray tracer when I was at Microsoft in 2011, and it took 32 uh, NVIDIA cards operating as one machine. Now you can get it on one card on an RTX. Uh, you know, the, the dream is real time ray tracing. Uh, like Ben said, what, what is 
what is tra tra uh, this ray and why do I need to trace it <laughs> for people that may not be familiar? <laughs> that was a good, good slam back at me. But basically, um, it's just the more we get closer to uh, mimicking reality uh, uh, visually in, in real time, that's super exciting. And it, it's been, you know, that process has been going on for, you know, ever since computer graphics came on. And, um, you know, every year it keeps getting better and better. Well, I find that, you know, often if I've got a headache or can't solve a problem, I just wait six months and then we've got a more powerful GPU in order to, that solves it. And, it, you know, there's a, and or, you know, the new version of Unreal, you know, comes out and, and it's solved a whole bunch of problems. But, um, you know, my, my business focuses on digital humans. As I say, my, I come at this equation as a, as a writer interested in digital human performance or characters. I don't even call them digital humans. They're just characters in your movies. So, you know, I'm really focused on pushing those digital digital humans performances within within feature films and so so that's you know there's a big um, hurdle or people sort of view that as a, as a hurdle in some ways and in some ways it is a hurdle I think it kind of depends on what types of productions and what types of visions you are trying to do with your with your movie um, but I'm always pushing that pushing that and that's you know we just got a Another another mega grant from Epic to uh, work continue working on our David Bowie project, which is sort of spearheading our digital human endeavors across you know that project and across all of our feature films that we're developing. So, but that's a that's that's going to be a, a very interesting area when we have really really core cool digital humans in this space, and uh, this just becomes the way things are done. The biggest hurdle that I or like the, the biggest change I'd like to see is uh, in education uh, because I don't think that schools, uh, whether they're universities or different types of you know training centers, they're not really doing changes fast enough to give. Uh, there's a lot of work out there right now. If you um, know your stuff and you, if you're if studying traditional filmmaking, you should definitely know what virtual production is. Um, and every university or school or training center that's offering this type of programs should be making, you know, these kids uh, being able to get jobs. And I don't see that happening, like in the curriculums or anything like that. Like, I don't think they're doing the changes that they need in terms of all these kids to know what the technology they need to use or at least know about and get their hands dirty before they, you know, get head out into the world. So I think there's a lot more education and training that needs to happen. So because there will, you know, this is just, this industry is just going to continue to grow and there is not enough talent out there. And so it would be great if schools kind of get on with the program. Yeah, I've been, I totally agree, Mariana. I mean, I, I've been talking to a lot of universities and stuff as a result of the real-time shorts challenge. And I'm actually uh, thinking about giving away the, all of my scene files and assets to educational institutions for any students can basically use these assets because I think if they've got really cool assets to play with, it inspires them to kind of make stuff. And I, as I said, I've been amazed as to what we, what, you know, what was resulted from the real-time shorts challenge. And, and would it be amazing if every single educational, you know, institution involved in this space was able to sort of dive in and do do amazing work and give these to the students. I mean, it's totally possible. It's just virtual assets. You can just give them away, yeah, so, yeah. Ben, any final thoughts from you? I, I, think, I think everybody here's, you know, Summed probably up. saturated the audience with too many feature requests. I think, like, we just need more and we just need faster. And, and quite frankly, I, I think what Mariana pointed out was the, was the most important part, which is we need more people with fresh perspectives, not us old fogies who are bringing our, our legacy thinking from our previous industries into this new world. We're creating a new world. These are fundamentally the technologies that will build a new world. We will exist in a world where the digital and physical work in concert together. We'll see it through glasses. We'll see it through our phones. And we do not need to make the same kind of entertainment that we've been making for hundreds of years. We can look at the canvas new and say, what things should exist now that we have all these capabilities rather than, well, because it's been done for hundreds of years this way, this is the way we should do it. So I hope that children uh, tell us all to shut the hell up and um, invent the next thing. And I hope it's not, you know, I hope it's not just TikTok echo chamber, repeat and play what everybody else did stuff. I think we need to be incentivizing original perspectives and original content and original experiences. And this, this empowers that at the, at the individual level, which is fantastic. Well, that's yeah, this great. is a great, great point. 
one, really. I, I thank you so much, guys. I'm conscious of time. I know we've already kind of run slightly over, and I know this will go on forever, I'm sure. Um, I'm, re I'm really blown away by your work, guys. I'm really grateful for you taking the time out of your schedules to join this discussion. Um, before we wrap up completely, I just wanted like, like take the opportunity to just make a quick announcement to everyone that Immersion is actually partnering with Glassbox Technologies to create an offer uh, for their tools for Immersion K members. So, yay! So, if you're interested in finding out more about the offer uh, or about joining um, Immersion K, then you can just send me an email. Um, but other than that, thank you all so much. I really appreciate. It. I wish I could matrix style download all your knowledge. <laughs> um, this was this was fantastic. So, thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks for having us. Thanks, Thank everybody. you, Asha. Thanks, everybody. Have a nice week. Thank Bye. you. Bye.